UK from here in London. Can Hello. Can, there, everybody's on mute, so. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll just assume. If, it, if it's possible to unmute for a moment, yes. um, if that's not too complicated, I just wondered if it might be helpful yeah. by um, me saying what I was thinking, some of the things I was thinking about talking about today, but of course, I'm really, really keen to hear right from the start what you guys would like to hear me talk about. Can um, so raise your hand if they can hear Sebastian? Okay. Okay, good, okay. So, um, so unmute themselves for one minute, and Sebastian is going to ask you what you want to hear to talk about. Thank you. So just to say, I was planning to um, talk a little bit about um, the sort of history of the research we've done into PCA here at UCL, and about things like uh, working together with our international colleagues to develop the consensus criteria. And then to talk about a few very sort of specific bits of research into things like particular reading challenges um, and also uh, different aspects of spatial perception. Um, and I also, also was going to mention problems uh, that many members of our support group have highlighted to us and which we're now studying around balance. So not just vision, but difficulty balancing, perceiving how one is, where one is within the world. Um, but it'd be really helpful if anybody wanted to just throw out any comments or questions at the start of things you'd particularly like me to, to cover. And then I can try and refer to those both, both as I go through a little bit of a talk, but also answer your questions at the end. Okay, anybody raise your hand if, if you um, want to say something about what you'd like to hear. I think the, the, what, what Dr. Crutch is, is ready to talk about, I think that it would be very interesting to guide us through that. And then at the end, what we can do is if anybody has any questions after and they want to go in a diff different direction. I did not get your slides, which is fine. I don't know that you even need them. Um, okay. So let's just do it. Okay. Shall I just jump in then? Yes, thank you. Um, so I've um, had the great pleasure of working with people with PCA for about 15 years now. Um, and um, as, as many of you will know, uh, in the UK, um, the issue of PCA got particular prominence through people like Terry Pratchett, the science fantasy author, um, talking about his own experience of PCA. Um, but as with many people, I often come back to the um, original descriptions uh, of Frank Benson, who was the first person to describe PCA back in 1988. Um, and I often start talks um, by just reading out one of those descriptions. And I thought I might just do that today because just always a helpful reminder that um, uh, we kind of stand on, in our understanding on the shoulders of those who've gone before and particularly those of you who living with or caring for someone with PCA who've been kind enough to share um, some, of the, some of your story with us. So one of uh, Frank Benson's original, um, the people he originally described, is described in his paper like this. It says, a 64-year-old former bank executive presented with episodes of anxiety that complicated a slowly progressive disturbance of vision and language. About eight years earlier, he had noted difficulty reading. He remained at his job, but his secretary had to read to him. Although still able to write, he could not read what he produced. Eventually, he also lost the ability to write and had difficulty finding his way in familiar areas and in performing visually mediated tasks. The problem slowly progressed, and he stated that what he saw disappeared before he could sense what it was. On examination, he was alert, oriented, attentive, and in reasonably good physical health. His manner was gracious, and his insight was painfully apparent. And the reason I start with that is because I feel that quite a lot of the people who come certainly to our PCA support group have never before met anybody else with PCA. And they've been trying to communicate these experiences, some of them kind of in plain sight, others much more difficult to put into words or articulate. And actually just that moment of meeting other people who know what it's like is often what I think the most valuable things about these sorts of groups. I'm so delighted to hear that you're forming this virtual group in the States. Um, 
So lots of people would nod along in our groups to those sorts of um, descriptions and particularly their subtle and um, very gradual declines of that, that long period of time when it feels like things, something's not quite right, but it's difficult to put your fingers on what it, what, on what it is. And also the fact that it's quite variable. We know that for some people with PCA, difficulties start particularly in seeing where things are. So those sorts of spatial problems that lots of you will have experienced, like clipping car wing mirrors, getting lost on a page when you're trying to read it as you try and move your eyes from the end of one line to the beginning of the next. Those sorts of things which are very much about where you're looking. Um, but also other people describing less problems with that, more problems with seeing what it is that you're looking at. So difficulties be it with faces or misperceiving objects when there's low lighting or things are a bit obscured or any of those sorts of um, challenges. Um, one other video that we often um, show is a, an audio recording of someone describing uh, a picture because we were aware that uh, many have became quickly aware that many of the psychological tests that are used in things like neurological clinics for diagnosing PCA only capture some of the things that people are describing as being difficult. So one simple addition we made was to add um, pictures of real world scenes. Um, so uh, one photo we showed a, a lady very, with PCA very early on in our research was a picture here in Brighton, of a, here in England, of a, of a place called Brighton, which is a seaside resort. And there's a picture with a, a beach in the foreground, uh, a pier stretching out to sea, and some sort of clouds and horizon in the distance. And it was really interesting that what, for a picture that most of us who don't have PCA would within two, 300 milliseconds have a good sense of, of what it was that we were looking at, you know, that it was an outside scene, that it was by the beach, etc., and then could inspect it more closely for detail. For this lady, it was a completely different proposition. And she said something, I'll paraphrase slightly, but she said something along the lines of, oh, well, I think maybe it's um, a railway or perhaps a building site. Or look here, perhaps it's what they're trying to build for the Olympics. Um, and then she paused and she looked harder and she looked harder. And then she said, or oh, perhaps it's the beach because down here it looks a bit sandy. Yes, maybe it's the beach or Brighton. And so she actually, within about 10 or 15 seconds, she got to absolutely the correct answer. But whereas it was a totally automatic process for me looking at this picture, for her it was a case of piecing together these bits of the puzzle. And particularly this sense that her, her vision had sort of restricted. It wasn't that she was blind to everything around the edges, but more that when she looked at a complex picture like this, she was only really pro able to process small parts of it at a time. And therefore, with that knowledge in mind, it was easy to make sense of what she was saying. So the picture, which I'm sorry isn't in front of you, but which is in front of me, shows the, the legs of the pier stretching out to sea. And you can completely imagine, if you just focused on those, why she might have been imagining it was a railway line with the sort of the tracks, um, the lines of the track um, proceeding to the distance. Or when she commented about the thing they were building for the Olympics, which seems out of context, actually then you see on the end of the pier, there's a small dome and perhaps she was misperceiving that as a sports stadium. So all of these things are totally logical. And very, you know, she was absolutely rational and using brilliant communication abilities to describe what she was seeing. It's just she was seeing something different to, to, to you or me, or at least she was only seeing part of the picture and she had to go through this arduous process of perception as, a, as putting together the pieces of a puzzle. And I think this is one of the many reasons why I don't know how you guys describe what it is that you're living with or what the person you're, you care for is living with. But lots of our folk um, are very happy, much happier with the term PCA and very anti the word dementia because it literally isn't true for them, particularly early in the course of the disease. They, they literally do not have dementia. They are not out of their mind in that, in that classical Greek sense of the word. And even if you look at the sort of medical definitions of dementia, for many people, they will start to notice something is wrong before that is true for them. And so in some people, particularly on, it's really this very prescribed difficulty with seeing what and where things are 
and some of the other subtle aspects that we'll see of it. And so words like dementia and even Alzheimer's disease, even if that is the underlying cause, because of all the prejudices and assumptions and misconceptions that lie around those words, those don't feel like words that people are happy to apply to themselves. And I think that's fine because I think the language we use um, to describe these things we're living with is particularly important. Um, so what we um, really started to do um, at UCL um, in the sort of mid 2000s was to say, why don't we simply why don't we ask some simple questions and ask people who are presenting uh, with these visual conditions with PCA to come and see us once a year to have a brain scan and to have some psychological testing, um, by which I mean neuropsychological testing, tests of memory and different types of perception and language and those sorts of things. And one of the things which I think um, tried to, which was a point we tried to make early on, was we, we asked um, once we'd, oh, collected brain scans from a number of people. We wrote a paper which um, compared the brain images grouped together of 48 people with PCA and 30 people with so-called typical or memory-led Alzheimer's disease. And all we did was very simple. We used a, a technique which allows us to compare the brain scans of those two groups of people and to ask questions about where are the, which bits of the brain, of the gray, the gray matter around the edge of the brain, which bits are thinner in people with PCA than memory-led Alzheimer's disease, and the reverse, which bits are thinner in people with memory-led Alzheimer's disease than PCA. And it's worth bearing in mind that all of these people, as far as we know, had Alzheimer's disease, as in plaques and tangles at the level of the brain cells, as the underlying cause. So it's, um, and what we found was that in, in these maps you can create um, showing areas that are thinner or less thin. The people with PCA had thin cortex at the back of the brain, so you can't really see with my gesturing, so the so-called occipital lobes right at the very back the parts of the brain that deal with the visual processing, and the parietal lobes in particular, which are just sort of up and to the top of the brain from the back. Um, those were the areas which were significantly thinner in people with PCA than people with typical Alzheimer's disease. And by contrast, it was the so-called temporal lobes and especially things like the hippocampus, um, which are these sort of structures which are critical to memory, which lie more at the side of our brains, which were thinner in people with typical Alzheimer's disease than PCA. And a couple of reasons why we thought this was worth doing, other than simply to raise awareness in the medical community about, about this condition, PCA, were one, to say that these different symptoms that people are describing when they have PCA have a biological cause because lots of people thought you know come to our clinic thinking they're going mad or that there's something wrong with their eyes or so many other explanations or they've been told that they're just anxious so many other reasons and actually simply to be able to say to people yes we understand we hear the conditions and the, and the challenges you're facing and this is this is the physical cause as far as we can determine it this particular thinning at the back of the brain and another reason we wanted to make this direct comparison was to say to people that you shouldn't, that the medical community, the dementia community at large, shouldn't dismiss people with PCA as being kind of rare or a special case, but actually to say people living with PCA when they feel able to contribute to research, and of course that's only if appropriate for people, have a real contribution to make because there are questions fundamental questions about Alzheimer's disease that we do not understand yet. So why can one disease, which as I said at the level of the brain, the plaques and tangles, at the molecular level, how can one disease affect different people in such radically different ways? Why is it that those plaques and, the tang and tangles in some people target the memory areas to start with and leave the visual areas relatively unscathed, and in other people, people with PCA, go for these more regions that are more at the back of the brain that are more interested in vision. We have to be able to understand these sorts of questions because that could, for all we know, be one of the keys to stopping either progression or even the development of the disease in future. Because maybe it's that people with PCA are, have particular preservation of the memory areas. Or maybe there's something else either in the genetic makeup 
or in other fact, other environmental factors that drives the disease to affect one part of the brain and not, a, not another. And of course, if we can understand what protects a part of the brain or slows or inhibits the disease entering other brain networks, then that could be really, really important, not just for people with PCA, but for everyone living with, you know, the half million people in the UK, the many millions of people around the world living with Alzheimer's disease. So it was an encouragement really to say that people with PCA have a really big contribution to make. Um, another question, um, in the UK, I suppose in the US as well, uh, researchers uh, quite rightly and increasingly are asking questions about how people living with um, PCA or another form of dementia can be involved in research. And traditionally that's been um, asking people to sit on boards or complete questionnaires or give their opinion about a research project that's already been designed. But I'd say one of the things we've found and learnt through the 10 years now of, of running the PCA support group is actually that there's so much more that those of you living with or caring for someone with these conditions can offer to research. Researchers need you in order to direct the questions that we're answering. So one particular example of this is in 2010, I think it was, one of our support group members, a lovely chap called Simon Rosser, um, whose wife had PCA, um, he heard uh, a couple of the presenters at one of our meetings talking about uh, PCA and Benson syndrome, which you may have heard is another name for PCA, or biparietal Alzheimer's disease. And he was very no-nonsense. He just stood up and he said, I don't understand. Don't you guys talk to each other? And he challenged us. He said, what, why, isn't, why isn't there a common language for describing these difficulties? Why isn't every doctor using the same scheme to determine whether or not someone has PCA? I don't know your individual stories, but my guess is that, as, as in our group, there will be those among you who've had painfully slow um, journeys to getting an answer. Some of you may have been told that you've had a stroke. Some of you may have been told that something's wrong with your eyes. Some of you may have been told that you're anxious or menopausal or, or many other things. And that's partly lack of, lack of knowledge and experience within the medical community because it is a relatively rare condition. But we, the medical community aren't helping themselves if they're using different words to describe or not having a consistent scheme. Um, so along with um, Gil and Brad, who I think you've spoken to before in previous meetings, and uh, representatives from about 25 different centres around the world, uh, we pulled together, if you like, a working party, a group of people interested in PCA, and came up with some recommendations about how, to, how we should describe PCA. And essentially, after lots of chat, and this was in a paper published last year, this boils down to trying to um, describe three PCA at three different levels. The first is to, is to define what we mean by the simple term PCA, posterior cortical atrophy. So that involved getting all of the different members of the group um, to essentially list the symptoms they consider most diagnostic of PCA, the symptoms which are really specific to PCA um, and, and which can separate PCA from other for example, other forms of Alzheimer's disease or other conditions. So we've got a list which includes things like, obviously, space perception problems, simultanagnosia, which is difficulty seeing two things at the same time, difficulty perceiving objects, um, difficulties with dressing, difficulty putting your hand to the right place, for example, when you're reaching out for a glass, those sorts of things which most people living with PCA would recognize most of. So. Defining PCA was the first thing. The second thing was to say, well, some people um, have just those symptoms and other people have those symptoms plus other challenges as well. So a particular example that's proven um, uh, difficult or problematic in the past is things like visual hallucinations. So there are a small number of people with PCA who also early on in the condition have visual hallucinations. And that has caused some people to say, oh, they haven't got PCA, they've got this thing called dementia with Lewy bodies. And that is, if you like, a confusion between 
the symptoms because PCA, all PCA does, it's not a disease, it's a syndrome. It's a collection of different symptoms and signs. And so the, the confusion with hallucinations is some people weren't being given that label of PCA because people were thinking, oh, I think there's a different underlying cause. I don't, the hallucinations make me think, oh, I don't think that's PCA caused by Alzheimer's disease. I think that's PCA caused by dementia with Lewy bodies. And then for reasons which I still don't really understand, we're therefore not giving people the PCA label, which means that they struggle to find the kind of information support, the kind of groups that you guys are offering. So what we did was simply to say that at this second level of classification, people should differentiate between PCA pure, which is people only fulfill the criteria for PCA and not the criteria for any other condition, or PCA plus, which is saying, yep, we've got, they fulfill the criteria for PCA, but there are also some additional features which might be relevant. And that's the reason for discriminating those is if you've got a treatment um, for a particular disease, say, then you need to know what the underlying cause is. But if you've got a therapy or a bit of advice or a strategy that's relevant to anyone with dementia-related visual problems, then it doesn't matter whether you've got these extra features or not. It should be the fact that you've got PCA that's most important. So it's a way of trying to say, if you've got the symptoms of PCA, you should be given that label because it may help you access stuff that's helpful. And then finally, the third level is simply to point out that there are multiple different diseases that could cause PCA. In reality, from the best of our understanding and from the evidence which is out there at the moment, from um, people with PCA who kindly donated their brains for research after their death. What we understand is that the vast majority of people who have PCA, probably 80 to 90%, have Alzheimer's disease, those plaques and tangles, as the underlying cause. In a small proportion of people, it may, the symptoms of PCA may be caused by another condition, which includes things like dementia with Lewy bodies, which we've mentioned, and a couple of rarer conditions, one called corticobasal degeneration, and one, and uh, also a form of prion disease. But those are pretty rare, and so by and large, um, we sort of put particularly thick arrows, if you like, to the to the form of PCA caused by Alzheimer's disease, PCAAD, because that's overwhelmingly the most common cause. So, anyway, so that was just a, an international effort to try and discriminate the different levels at which we can describe PCA because one of the other reasons for describing PCA at the disease level is of course, we don't want people with PCA, for example, caused by Alzheimer's disease to be excluded from drug trials. If there's a new treatment for Alzheimer's disease that will, might slow things down or have some sort of benefit, why should people with PCA form of Alzheimer's disease be excluded from that? Of course they shouldn't. So there needed to be a robust way of saying people, you can have PCA for symptoms, and Alzheimer's disease, that the disease or the cause, and those two things aren't kind of exclusive of one another. But we can come back to that again a bit later on in questions if that's helpful. Um, very briefly, one of the other advantages of that um, international group is that, of course, PCA is relatively rare. Um, and so things like genetic studies are hard to do if you're just one centre with maybe a dozen folk um, who you see at any one time. And so the group, the international group, agreed to pool, to work together and pool um, samples, blood samples, tissue samples from people who had kindly given those, so that we were able to gather together a group of over 300 people with PCA and to look at whether the genetic risk factors for, P for PCA are any different to typical Alzheimer's disease. And there's some indication from this preliminary analysis, even with 300, those are quite small numbers for a genetic study. But there's some indication that people with PCA um, have a slightly different risk profile to people with typical Alzheimer's disease. There's one gene in particular um, uh, uh, called APOE4, which has been noted to be a particular risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, which seems to be slightly less of a risk factor for PCA. Still, still a risk factor, but not, not so much as, for, as for, the, for the memory version. And also intriguingly, a, um, three uh, what are called SNPs, bit, little bits of the genetic code, which may indicate some sort of extra risk for PCA, which, which have never been identified as risk factors for typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease before. 
And so I should stress these are not the kind of genetic changes that you can inherit as far as we're aware or that which make, you know, which determine that you will get the disease. These are things which might slightly increase your risk. And so I don't, I want to reassure you in case um, you ha have these concerns. Uh, I don't think, I personally have never met anybody who has an inherited form of PCA. I think there are one or two case reports out in the literature of people claiming for PCA running in a family. I personally don't think the evidence even in those cases is very strong. So it really does seem different to um, so-called familial Alzheimer's disease uh, in less than 1% of people um, with Alzheimer's disease that you know, the disease literally seems to run in a family as in one in every two children get the disease if one of the parents had it. I've, we've never seen that in PCA and so I'd encourage you that I don't think having PCA means your children are at any greater risk of having PCA but again we can talk about that more later if that would be helpful um, just to uh, update you one other thing we're just working on at the moment is no one had also ever really looked at longitudinally so over time what happens and changes in PCA um, and in particular some people have asked oh is PCA just a different start to Alzheimer's disease and eventually does it all become one in the same thing so a number of people over 120 people now with PCA and a similar number of folk with typical Alzheimer's disease and, and people who don't have either condition have kindly um, uh, been part of had at least one or up to five or six scans over many years to enable us to say over time how do these how does the volume for example of different parts of the brain change and what it seems like is that it doesn't just all merge over time and that actually if you start with PCA often there are certain parts of the brain which remain relatively distinct so for example and um, the memory parts of the brain and particularly the frontal parts of the brain the, the levels of shrinkage, if you like, that we see over time in PCA never catch up with the rates of shrinkage that we see for people with typical Alzheimer's disease. So I think if, if we're looking for a kind of a practical application of that bit of information, I would say that if you were given the label PCA, right the way through, people involved in your care should be thinking about what, how different your needs might be um, and not just assuming, oh, it's been going for a few years, therefore let's just treat them the same as everybody. That sort of generic approach. I think we need to continue having tailored care and advice and support, even if over time, of course, problems other than memory do develop. Um, I don't know how people's attention levels are going. I was going to chat for about another 10 minutes, but if you if you'd like to stop and answer questions ask questions at this stage, then that's totally fine. But I've got Jamie giving me the thumbs up, so I'll, I'll, I'll plow on for now. But, um, so let me change tack a little bit and tell you um, about a couple of other projects, um, specifically about reading and also about balance, just as an example. So one of the um, other observations which was incredibly helpful early on is I remember sitting uh, a lady called Margaret um, who was kindly helping with our research and we were actually having to administer a memory test in which involved me showing Margaret some printed short printed words nice clear font um, and asking her to read and remember these words and I remember turning over the very first card, which was a very simple word. I think it was sand. And she said to me very strikingly, she said, I can see the S. I can see the D, but I can't make out the letters in the middle. And her, this was nothing to do with eyesight. The font was the right size. Her eyesight was good. And what we realized over time is that lots of people with PCA have difficulty with what we call excessive crowding, which is when clutter other stuff in the environment, other stuff you can see, sort of interferes with and tangles with the, the thing you're trying to look at. So the way we've tested this kind of in, in experiments is, is with really simple tests where we show people three letters and say, can you just tell me the letter in the middle? And sometimes with these flankers, you can change what these things either side are. They, don't, they could be other letters or you could change them to numbers or just to symbols. 
but what, what really make it what really makes the difference for people is how spread out they are because if you put three things together even if you or I could, without PCA, could see them clearly. Someone with PCA often has great difficulty seeing the thing in the middle because features of all three kind of blend together and actually often make people see something, a letter which isn't even there. So it's difficult, again, with you not being able to see. But for example, if I showed a T, a G, and an X, often I'd say to people, what's the letter in the middle? And they would say, why? because they're taking the top of the X and the bottom of the T and those are getting blended together. And it's just an example of how things which, you know, I apologize, but for, for those of us who don't have PCA, we totally take our vision for granted. We have zero comp comprehension of how complex what our brain is, our, of the complexities of what our brain is doing every moment when we're looking at an object or looking at a letter or seeing where something is. Our brain is doing thousands of computations every second. And so this simple example of reading one letter has profound implications for things like reading text. Loads of people with PCA have described to us how reading text, read, reading a newspaper or um, reading a book is so hard. And of course, partly that's because every, on every line, every letter, every word is surrounded by other letters and words. And what we found, um, we've been developing a reading app recently which tries to um, make uh, words more, fr pr to present them in a way which is more PCA friendly. So for example, this crowding thing is a major influence. So what we've done is just um, make sure that the, the app feeds people either one word at a time or just a few words at a time so that there aren't words either side and above and below to, to cause this confusion. You just get fed the words that, that you're looking for at the time and not, all, not the distraction of all the other words. One other thing which um, people have um, described, which again was very striking, uh, one gentleman who came to my colleague Nick Fox's clinic um, had this very strange experience. He was on the way to work on the train and he opened up his newspaper and he found that he could read the small print of his newspaper, but he couldn't read the headlines. And what puzzled him even more was then when he looked further down the carriage, someone else had this, was reading the same newspaper and he was able to read their headlines. And the reason I bring this up is, is twofold. One, if you've never heard of PCA, as many general practitioners, family doctors, etc., haven't, that kind of thing makes you sound kind of crazy because it just doesn't make sense to those of us who don't think about our vision. How could someone have more difficulty reading big words than small words? It's the sort of, it's total, it's the total opposite of what people usually expect. And, he, and even more so, why could he read someone else's headlines but not his own? But actually, if you've worked with a few people with PCA, this stuff makes total sense, not just because lots of people say things like this and have an experience of being able to see something that's smaller, not larger, but because, for example, those headlines that were further away, on the image on the back of your retina, it's smaller because it's further away, it creates a smaller image on uh, the back of your retina. So big words a long way away are quite like small words. And so they kind of get through. And it, again, it comes back to this notion of a restriction of vision that we talked about when we, I was just saying about the description of the Brighton Pier picture, this notion of only being able to see one part of the picture at, at a time. If, you've got, if you do have this restriction in what you can perceive in one go, then small words can kind of fall through that that focus whereas a big word you have to look at it and take it in in lots of different chunks so that's often why people are surprised when small things can be processed more difficult uh, with more ease so actually slight, sometimes slightly smaller text can be easier to read and it also makes sense of comments that sometimes um, uh, carers mentioned to me uh, those of you uh, supporting someone with dementia on a number of occasions that I don't understand. I, my wife or my husband or whoever it is can sit at a table and completely fail to see the thing right in front of them, be it a pen or a glass or a fork or whatever it is. And then two moments later, they might go, oh, and they reach down and they pick up this tiny fleck of dust off the floor or something like that. And it makes no sense to people because people think the other thing was so clear. How could you see this microscopic thing? 
Well, it's actually for most people with PCA, their ability, their acuity, their ability to see small things is really pretty preserved because that's right at the very back of the brain apart, which isn't quite so affected. It's the ability to see small things or to make sense of things that are spread out, that have multiple parts or are spread over an area of space, which is really hard. And so sometimes these things are worth thinking about, not just for the geeky psychologists like me, but to try and share and say, A, you're not the only one to have that experience. But B, there are loads of stuff about PCA which on the surface don't make sense and can cause people to um, perhaps other family members or friends, people who don't know you so well, to think that you're being inconsistent or perhaps even having them on. Another example in these sorts of inconsistencies is the issue about where things are. Sometimes people can fail to see something right in front of them. And the interpretation by others of that can be really unhelpful. So, for example, if, some, if you're at a dinner table and someone says, oh, can you pass the salt? And it's right in front of you. If you don't do it, people assume you're just being difficult or unwilling or unhelpful. And of course, that's not the case. But people need to be able to understand what's, what's manageable and what's hard and also where the inconsistencies lie in order to respond to people appropriately. I'm going to... Um, stop blathering on in one moment the, the last thing I was going to uh, there are lots of other things I could happily talk about and I'm happy to answer questions but just to make sure we get to questions sooner rather than later and um, the one other thing I was going to mention briefly is this uh, notion of balance that I mentioned um, so this really came about uh, when uh, I'll, in fact I'll just read you the two quotes in one of our PCA support group meetings we were um, we were writing with the members this thing called the seven stages of PCA, which some of you may have found on our support group website, which is an attempt not to say PCA pres uh, pres uh, progresses in the same way in everybody, but to try and give some common experiences of what happens and then what happens next and what happens after that. And when we were going through this document, um, a couple of the members um, stopped us and said, what do you think about adding in something about proprioception, so the ability to sort of feel or sense where you are in space? They said it's important to include not just where other things are, but where your body is in space, because that was again quite marked in my mother-in-law. And then the other relative popped up and said, yeah, she asked me the question the other day. She said, am I the right way up? And this lady said, which is comical, but actually it's quite distressing, I think. So this notion of am I the right way up, really got us thinking about is this really just a visual problem or do we need to be thinking about the many things which the affected parts of the brain in PCA are actually doing because it's not these are not just visual centers it's not just about seeing what and where things are it's about things like hearing what and where things are and feeling what and where things are so this parietal lobe, which I mentioned, often takes the brunt of the action early on in PCA. That's one of the areas which is particularly of the brain, which is particularly involved in integrating or, or blending together different senses, our vision, our hearing, our touch. And um, so that's what we had a sense people were referring to when we were talking about balance. And someone else hearing this description, as is often the case at these support groups, then piped up. Oh, I just wanted to say something about posture, because I also, also think that's a bit of a problem. My former partner who has PCA doesn't just shuffle, but he's actually leaning to one side. And it's just very, very difficult. You can't get him to stand up straight. And it also means that helping him to get a jacket or a coat on is that much more difficult. And then someone else in the group um, said, oh, well, that's interesting. Sometimes when I'm walking along the pavement, I feel like I'm about to fall off the edge of the world. And his partner said, oh, that's interesting because he doesn't look like that. He doesn't, he feels he's leaning over, but he's actually walking perfectly straight. So in those two examples, you've got this sense that for some people, they do walk straight, but they feel like they're leaning. And in other people, it's the other way around. They're actually leaning, but they feel like they're straight. So the, and it, of course, how, how would you stand up if you thought you were standing up straight and then people tell you to stand up straight? What are you going to do? How are you going to change things? So we're doing this study at the moment uh, with a balance expert, a guy called Professor Brian Day here at UCL, in which people are being asked, we're trying to explore how much of this sort of sense of imbalance 
is caused by the vision, by the visual input the brain is uh, receiving not being as good as it should be? How much is it caused by the balance system not being able to sense things like body posture and how much you're leaning over? And how much is it a problem of the, those two systems, the visual and the balance system, talking to each other? So we're having people, for example, stand in the laboratory in front of a screen with lots of dots on it, which are either still or which start rotating one way or the other way, which induces in most of us a sort of a sense of leaning to one side or the other. And it turns out people with PCA, those folk who kindly helped us with the experiment so far, are having stronger reactions and leaning or fall, even falling. We have, a, we have a harness to make sure no one gets hurt, so there's something to catch them. But they are falling and leaning much more than anybody that Brian has ever worked with. He spent his life working with people with balance disorders caused by things like Parkinson's disease and strokes and tumors. And the effect of balance and of these stimuli in people with PCA seems really, really strong. So of course, this won't necessarily be everybody, but again, it's something that's worth talking about because so often we find in these, in these rarer forms of dementia that people are having these experiences or questions or uncertainties that you don't understand, that we, the so-called experts, don't understand. And unless we talk about these things, we can't develop our knowledge, we can't un endorse or kind of normalize for you that actually this is a common feature. It's not that you're going crazy or that you've got a brain tumor or something else wrong, but actually trying to recognize and say, this is just a complex condition and it's got many features we haven't recognized before. Um, so I'm gonna stop blathering there, but I hope that's just a sort of a bit of a flavor of the work that I feel we can all do together that you can do with the clinicians and researchers you know in the States and that within groups like the one you fantastically started and the established group in Colorado and others, it's really such an important conversation, not just for you to feel support between them from one another, but also you really can drive the, and shape and improve the quality of the research that's happening into the PCA. So thank you very much for your time and your attention. Wonderful. Um, I'm unmuting everybody right now. And thank you, Simon, that was amazing. And if anybody has something, a question uh, for Dr. Crutch, uh, please just raise your hand and, and uh, let's just have some uh, understanding of, of, you know, just state your question and then that's, that would be it. I think I have everybody unmuted. Um, I, I, have, I have one question I'll start off with and that sure. is, so this staging system, so I read a lot about what other people say on, on your support groups and, and, and online and, and it seems that, that people, do you think people understand staging and, and, you know, who helps them understand like where they are in, 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 in this illness? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the first caveat is to say it's not a perfect system. I suppose if I go back in, into the history of it, the reason that we made this with, with the members of our support group is because understandably people were getting frustrated with asking questions like what will happen next or how long will I be able to do such and such for and getting that sort of blank non-committal answer from everyone they asked that goes along the lines of, oh, sorry, it's different for everybody. It's difficult to tell. Because on one level, that's totally true. We're all different, we've got different brains, the conditions we're experiencing are different and the rates at which they progress aren't the same. But we felt that if we kind of pooled our experience, we hoped that we would be able to have a slightly more helpful response to people or make it a, a bit more nuanced. So that the stages are not to um, dictate um, the speed at which things will progress. They are more about the order in which people have tended to experience symptoms. And of course, absolutely, there will be many people who experience things in a slightly different order. So it's very much a generalization, but one which our support group members suggested would be uh, sort of, it'd be better to have something that was imperfect than nothing at all. Wonderful. Anybody have any questions for Dr. Crutch? Just, yes. Go ahead, uh, Kat, uh, Beth. I have a question um, about the hallucinations with the vision and um, I, I do get those. Right. And I'm wondering when I do get them, typically, um, I was gonna say it's not, at, well, it's not at any particular time of the day, but I, oh, I should say it, it's with movement. Is right. that typical of this? 
can I can I ask you just a little bit to say a little bit more about that? Do you mean yeah. you, as in yes. your your hallucinations move or or motion seeing things that are moving tends to trigger them? I don't know. I actually can't decipher between the two. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, it's difficult to describe. So it feels like sometimes when I'm walking, I'll see something at my feet. Right. Like a cat ran by or something, and there's yeah. nothing there. Or if okay. I'm looking out the window and I'm waiting for, say, my husband to drive up, I can't tell if someone's driving up or not. Okay. Yeah, so um, uh, one of the things we... One of the speakers we had at a recent support group meeting over here in London is a guy called Rob Howard, um, who's a very senior psychiatrist involved in care of people with dementia here in the UK. And he, he basically said, we, we, don't, we don't have a neuropsychiatry of PCA. It's not something that people have really looked into in any detail yet. So the distinction he did make when he was hearing members of our group talk about their hallucinations was he discriminated between illusions, which is when perhaps there's something in what our environment that we've seen or seen a bit of, which triggers us to perceive something that's either different or not actually there, but has some similarity to something that's there, if that makes any sense. It does, because I did that too. <laughs> so it yeah. does make sense. Yeah. yeah. And, and other hallucinations which seem to occur or emerge for reasons you know, unrelated to what's around us. Um, so I think there's a mixture of those things. Um, and it, in some ways, it sort of doesn't necessarily matter that much which one is which. It's about what you do with it. I know a lot of people have, um, who experience hallucinations have found that sometimes bringing something that is clear into view can help to make the, um, the either illusion or hallucination disappear. I remember particularly the story of um, one lady who didn't actually have PCA, but she had this condition called dementia with Lewy bodies. And I remember a nurse who went to see her regularly at her home, being really puzzled the first time she met her by looking around her living room and finding that the plaster in the walls was all chipped. There were lots of little holes in her wall. And after she got to know this lady a bit better, um, uh, she realized that this lady also was having hallucinations. She was tending to see people. And she realized that the one, th this lady had realized that the one thing that made them disappear was when she poked them with her walking stick. Yeah. Um, and I think, I guess, it, at least in terms of illusions, I interpret that as perhaps uh, for whatever reason, that lady's brain was giving her the impression that there was someone standing there perhaps triggered by, you know, something on the wallpaper or, or something else in the room. Um, but actually when a clear walking stick came into view, the brain sort of realized it's, it's perceptual mistake, if you like, and went, Oh, there's not a person there. There's just a walking stick causing the, um, uh, the hallucination to disappear. So I think sometimes having something clear come into view or increasing light levels can sometimes help with these illusions. But I think it is also for the hallucinations, I think it is just incredibly difficult and um, for us to, to know how best um, to change things. I remember again talking to another gentleman who had uh, dementia with bodies who described, he, was, um, he said, I'm starting to see things like uh, door frames and table edges bending. And he said, I, I know they can't bend. I know they're solid inanimate objects, but that's what I'm seeing. So one had very much this sense for him, and I don't know if this is how you feel, of kind of almost being in tension. You have to kind of hold the, the world as you know it to be with the world as you perceive it to be. And it must, I can only, I can't begin to imagine how difficult that must be. Thank you, Seb. Is there any, any other questions? Yes, Anne? Um, my difficulty is cursive writing and spelling. Is yeah. that, how does that fit into this? So uh, absolutely common, co common comment. So cursive writing, sort of hand, like handwriting, um, yes. is particularly difficult because it's simply perceptually more complicated than simple text. Yes. So in the, in the reading research we've done, um, cursive writing was hardest. And then it was so-called so serif script, so printed script, but you know, the, the script that has those little twiddles on it. Yes. And, this, and 
the easiest to read was the sans serif, the you know Arial and those slightly uglier fonts, which are just simply more plain and have less twiddles and confusions that can kind of blend or blur with other words. So I think it's completely normal. That doesn't make it any less frustrating, I'm sure. Um, but I think the more simplified forms of script uh, tend to be better. And yes, spelling is again something that was very, very high up the list of things that people comment or complain about early on in, in their condition. Um, and I think this reminds us that PCA is not just about what we explicitly see around us, but also our, our ability to visualize things in our head. So our, our representations of shapes and forms and faces and so forth. Um, and lots of people um, with PCA who um, have mentioned these sorts of spelling difficulties to us um, uh, kind of find ways through spell checkers and things to, to keep writing and typing if that's what they want to do. But absolutely their ability to rely on their internal representation of the order in which letters go, or indeed how many letters, how many of each letter there are, is something which is a, a cause for real frustration. Lots of people have moved over to sort of having um, those sort of or those computer devices that that convert spoken um, spoken words into into text for them because either the spelling or the or the finding the keys on the keyboard becomes so irritating. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Michelle. Yeah. Hi. Um, this was extremely helpful for me. Just um, as far as it, making me more aware of. It, it's kind of hopeful, actually, because it, it helps me as a support person. My husband has it. And he's 56. Um, he's been cognitively, I've seen more of a decline than the last, I, would, I say, even a month. But I'm noticing a lot of struggles with him on his language, finding that word, getting that word or phrase, or even his memory is wonderful, obviously, but he struggles to communicate uh, more so even then I'm noticing the visual issues. Yes, it goes along the lines of what you're saying with, you know, off and depth perception and, you know, just him, little things. But the language, I was wondering, my question is, and a friend of us was talking, we were talking about filling in the blanks kind of. Does that help with the frustration for him? I mean, is that a good thing to do? Or is it just to, I, you know, I just want to be there as much as possible to help that alleviate that stress yeah um do you see we didn't talk a lot about language issues yeah. or problems in this yeah absolutely do you so see that commonly or is that something that's yes. more unique so, so just to i don't know if it encourages the right word but certainly to recognize that experience lots of people with pca um have difficulties with some aspects of language from quite early on um, when we've looked at this in our in our tests, um, what we found is that the, the aspect of language that seems to be particularly difficult is the sound the sound element of words. So the the things that people describe struggling with earlier on is either finding the word or getting the sound out. The meaning of words, certainly the understanding okay. of words being spoken, is very well preserved. Like with like with episodic memory, this is a one thing it's called semantic memory. But yes, those sound elements, and particularly things uh, which, um, so in in folk with PCA, you asked about kind of how much you can help. We did find that, for example, in in a picture naming test, um, that people tended to be helped a little bit by being given the first sound of a word. Okay. Um, because that's the sort of sound prompt in order to access the meaning, which is absolutely still there. Yes. Um, but whether that's something people would enjoy is, is go, falls back into that, that, you know, that difficult area of it depends about you and your relationship and how much right. you kind of are able to juggle that balance between wanting to, wanting to help or wanting to be helped. And of course, for all of us in all of our relationships, not just living with PCA, that's hard because there are times when, we need and what and recognize that we need help in a particular area and other times where we just want to struggle a bit more ourselves okay um, so that's so awesome. yeah i think generally because the meaning aspect of language is better preserved than the sound aspect of language then i know a lot of people with pca have found a more useful strategy is to try and find is to so-called circumlocute to try and find another way of saying it rather than to persist with trying to find that particular word or receiving prompts from someone else. Um, okay. So, but I, again, I, I'm not pretending for a moment that that's easy, but I think try, trying to retrieve the sound 
um, it is hard and probably being and certainly for some people being given the whole word or people trying to anticipate what you're talking about can be frustrating so trying to encourage people to find a different way of saying it is often yeah. uh, uh, sort of the least worst approach well and with my husband he's he's very social always has been has a very strong network of friends and mm. and for him this is a huge change from his personality because now he's more of a spectator i've noticed in the social groups so from what i've gathered i mean he has a very wonderful attitude and and things um and he wants to just continue on as he is but i think for me what i've recognized in this Friends, it's like when you fill in that blank, he seems to be more engaged. Um, he doesn't really, um, it doesn't discourage him. He just like continues on, which, you know, I'm, I'm kind of go off of his, his lead. He, he gets more frustrated when he can't get something out. And yeah. if I just fill in that blank, if I know, cause I know him so well that exactly. it, it just can, it keeps the flow going and he seems more at peace kind of in right. the whole social setting which absolutely and i think often in social settings it obviously it depends how big the group is and how well people know one another but allowing people just that little as you'll i'm sure will have found some 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 of our friends are better allowing us that space to get out what yeah. we want to say other people are much less comfortable with silence and tend to fill the, the air with with another yeah. comment and that yeah obviously it's difficult because it not only prevents the person with the language difficulty to get, having to get the words out but it also often means the topic of conversation has moved on before they can contribute what they wanted to contribute which is of course hugely frustrating so it sounds great if you found a way of navigating right. that wonderful yes are there any other questions before we let dr crutch get on with his day and and we can get on with our days i see yes a question from pam let me just unmute you unmute you okay pam <laughs> Hi, hi, Dr. S Professor Seb. Um, we have Please a lot call of me about Seb. Please call me Seb. <laughs> Seb. <laughs> I get corrected once when I didn't call you Professor from uh, no, no. someone. <laughs> um, my question is with frustration again. We're having a lot of balance problems. We're probably 18 years into this PCA. Wow. And Jan will fall and, or trying to get into a car or trying to get on the hairdresser's seat. Um, just any kind of, especially if she's somewhere where she has to sit down, it's very frustrating. We're kind of making it into a joke and we're sort of going with the, we'll try it a few times and if she absolutely can't sit down, then we're just walking away. Yeah. I mean, is that, it, making it a joke, is that the right thing to do? I, I mean, we don't know. Uh, I mean, if, if that, it depends on the person, but yeah, certainly that's a tactic. Lots of people have adapted. One of one of the best um, sort of comedy uh, balance problems anyone in our group has ever related to me was uh, one of our friends in the group who was at a dinner party um, and went off to the loo and came back and thought he'd seen his chair and did his absolute best to put his bottom on it, but ended up sitting in the lap of uh, the gentleman next to him who happened to be his vicar. <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm waiting to write the balance paper that's that is called I sat on my vicar because I think it's a pretty great anecdote but yeah and you know and he was completely able to see the humor in that situation maybe the, of course there'd be other situations in which it's embarrassing or, or difficult or the person was less understanding but I think so many people in our groups have found comedy as a kind of necessary and inevitable way of getting through these things because while some of the things are challenging Actually, a lot of people, like in all of us, as with all of us, this is not a PCA specific thing. Sometimes humor just gets you through those difficult moments. Yeah, and we do have the thing where um, she will ask if she's upside down sometimes. Interesting, okay. You know, am I upside down? I'm like, no, you're not upside down. <laughs> so, which is something within the last year. That's really interesting because I've not heard many people use that phrase, but uh, we, one lady who we used to work with um, uh, once had, a, and I've never heard this from anybody else, but she had a, a, a complete reversal of vision. So one day, one morning, she came down the stairs from her room and she said, I went into the kitchen and suddenly everything was upside down. The bottom was on the top and the top was on the bottom. And it only lasted for a few minutes. Um, and I've never heard it described again by her or anybody else. 
but yes. this uncertainty about orientation is 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 very clear her and vision well she will see something but it's not necessarily the correct she'll see a yeah. bed but she doesn't know if she's in a bedroom or in the living room and she's not sure if the bed's the right way yeah and so. this is a bit this is a bit of a, a geeky answer and it doesn't I, in some ways it doesn't really help but I was interested when we started working with this balance expert that I mentioned mm -hmm. I was really interested to hear him say that there is no one cell in the human brain that tells you which way is up our mm -hmm. sense of up which we all to most of us totally take for granted is a combination of mm -hmm. you know synchronized firing of lots of different cells some in the inner ear some in the eye some in the brain stem um, and it, so it's just this sense of, you know, just recognizing the sheer complexity of the everyday and the, which most of us aren't, for, aren't sort of forced to um, embrace or acknowledge until we get something like PCA. Well, Thank you. Is there any research in, for instance, with the writing or spelling to just keep practicing doing those things that that can help or is that just like wasting time to do that? Um, I th I'm not aware of any um, sort of, if you like, rehabilitation research within PCA that shows that by keeping doing it makes it better. Okay. But of course, that, but there is lots of general, you know, use it or lose it type research in, in aging and in dementia in general that shows that finding ways of keeping mentally active, albeit ways that don't sort of drive one to frustration, are useful and do, and do help sort of, uh, continue our cognitive function for longer for all of us so i think it's it's getting that balance right of keeping mentally active absolutely is a good thing to do um doing it in a way or plugging away at something which is so frustrating that it drives you drives you mad would yeah. would, would, would just mean you just need to choose a, a different kind of different men mental exercise or cognitive exercise i think okay so thank it, you. yeah Wonderful, Zeb. Thank you so much. Uh, it, Not at all. Amazing, and you'll come again as our guest. I hope. Please, I'd be delighted, and I'm really sorry again for the confusion about timings and things. Thank you, Thank so, you much. so much, everybody. This Thank will be on the recording, and it'll be up in a few hours. Thank you all so much. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Enjoy your days. You too.